I'm Carol Cohn, and welcome to Purpose 360, the podcast that unlocks the power of purpose to ignite business and social impact. Today's segment is just going to be yummy, yummy for the brain and yummy for the soul, because we have a provocative conversation with Christopher Miller, head of global activism strategy at Ben and Jerry's. We're going to explore what does cutting edge activism look like today? How do you find the right issues to engage with? Why are values based actions so critically important? How do you be authentic? Well, Ben and Jerry's is absolutely authentic. The company, as we all know and love the ice cream, founded in 1978, sold to Unilever in 2000. And because of a very special covenant that they built into the sale, it allows them to retain their core soul and ethos. They have a wonderful sustainability report, and I will put some uh, a link in it in our show notes for you to take a look at it. I always do buy the numbers in our segments, but I want to talk here about the activism numbers for Ben and Jerry's. 3.3 million page views with an average time on the site of 5.14 minutes. And that was in response to their statement, their in your face statement in response to the murder of George Floyd. 66 unique activism campaigns run globally one vote by the Board of Alders in the city of St. Louis, where they had a very focused campaign. You're going to be absolutely mesmerized by Chris talking about it. To close the workhouse prison, 15% of all Ben & Jerry's advertising dollars go to support activism campaigns globally. And there are almost 200,000 actions taken on BenAndJerry.com. Uh, representing a 68% increase over 2019. The purpose of the company, we use ice cream to change the world. And of course, we love their flavors. And every year there's a different top 10. But the number one flavor in 2021 was brownie batter core. And I just like to end with this comment because so many of um, our clients and colleagues in the industry and when we go to conferences, they say, well, what issue do we pick? And as Chris Miller said in a very uh, wonderful Harvard Business Review article, the reality is there's never a bad moment to start doing the right thing. And in fact, we need you to get involved. This is not an exercise to find the perfect brand cause fit. If you don't know what you want to do, talk to your staff, get people together, create the space for this discussion around values. You could decide that your thing will be the humane society. It could be packing lunches. It can be anything. What it can't be is nothing. So join me with this discussion on activism with Chris Miller from Ben and Jerry's. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Carol. It's really great to be here. So Chris, I have to be very um, candid is that um, I am basically a peer to Ben and Jerry, um, hung out with them in the earliest days when we were all members of the Social Venture Network. And I can remember being across the table from them. They're so funny. And, you know, Anita Roddick's in the group and you've got um, Gary Hirschberg and um, Jeffrey Hollander, who I know that you were at um, Seventh Generation for a while. I guess Jeff was gone by then. So um, it's just wonderful to see the commitment of Ben and Jerry's. And what I want to do today is really discuss activism and especially take all of your wisdom And share it with our listeners, because our listeners are not at the cutting edge like Ben and Jerry's. You know, they they really aren't the most progressive. They know they have to get involved in society and the environment. And I want us not only to titillate them a bit, um, inform them, uh, and inform them a lot. So that's where we're going to go with this. So first, let's just talk about you. 
So um, who is Chris Miller? And tell me about this this very kind of interesting and different role that you have at Ben and Jerry's. Thanks again for having me, Carol. Uh, it, it's great to be here. And, you know, I believe I have one of the best jobs in the world. Uh, I lead the the sort of strategy development for the advocacy and activism work at a company that has a 44-year history of, of using its platform to advance progressive social change. As, as you noted, uh, uh, you know, and you go back, you know, way back with Ben and Jerry and a number of you know, uh, Anita and Jeffrey, those who really rode the first wave of, of corporate social responsibility, right? They, they were doing this. They, they sort of pioneered it. Absolutely. Uh, a business model that, that didn't exist prior, uh, to them sort of rethinking the role of business. And so I'm incredibly privileged to, to, to get to continue to evolve and innovate the way in which you know, a, a corporation like Ben and Jerry's can be a part of advancing progressive social change in the world, while at the same time building a strong and and beloved brand. And and it's it's a great privilege to to get to do it. And talk a little bit about your background, because it's not your tradition. It's not a comms background, per se. You've got an advocacy background. So just anybody who's listening, they go, boy, I want that job. I think part of what makes the magic happen at Ben and Jerry's is that we marry people with the skills and background of folks like me. So I really come from the, from the sort of policy and advocacy background. I, I started my career on the staff of, of Congressman Bernie Sanders. I spent half a dozen years at Greenpeace hanging activists off of coal plants. You know, my, my background is not in corporate communications. I don't have an MBA. Um, and so I think why it works so well now at Ben and Jerry's is because we, we take people that have skills like me and we marry them with the world-class marketing and communications talent that exists at the company. Those two things together create, I think, the, the, the authenticity, the credibility uh, uh, that we have uh, in doing this work. And how many people on your team? No? We have activism managers in nine countries around the world, six in Europe, the United States, Canada, and Australia. So in, in addition to some regional support folks in Europe, there's about a dozen folks whose, whose focus is on activism and advocacy at the company. And, and those people are people that almost exclusively come from civil society, NGO, uh, advocacy, and activism world. I want to dive into authenticity here because I think that that's a lot of what we can add to the discussion for all of those companies who are not quite that, you know, that progressive as, as Ben and Jerry's. So you talked about that they come from civil society. And I know in some of your previous interviews, you talk about that you really need to work with NGOs on the ground. You've got to, you know, have a relationship. So why is that important? Because I think companies today in general, yeah, I'm going to donate some money to this not-for-profit and I'm going to put their logo in, in my stories, but it's got to go way farther than that. You know, our approach is very different. Our approach is not one based on a model of philanthropy. I think we have an enormous platform at Ben & Jerry's, and we have the ability for our partners and the allies that we work with to help them mainstream their ideas and their campaigns. And so we are an ice cream company. We are not experts on the best way to reimagine public safety, right? But, but we work with people who are. And so our approach is, is, is to take the strategies of our, of our partners and bring the unique set of tools that we have as a for-profit ice cream company to bear to help advance the strategies of our partners and the movements that we work with. And so, and I believe that there is, exponentially more value to our partners in that kind of relationship than simply a philanthropic one. Because we have access to resources and skills 
that our civil society partners just wouldn't have access to. Um, you know, we have we have a team at Ben and Jerry's that focuses on consumer uh, and and public insights. We have right. We have the ability to spend sizable portions of our marketing budget in support of this work. And so we're really able to add uh, uh, much more value and expertise than would be the case if we were simply writing a check. And it builds, obviously, a much deeper relationship between Ben and Jerry's and the people that we're working with. And that really, that that's really a, a, a key component of what makes this work authentic. You know, we have a very strong set of values, uh, uh, things we believe. But but when we take on this work, we do it in service of those who are often on the front lines, impacted by the issues that we're working on. And so, I think that that's a critical component to to, to this kind of authenticity and credibility that 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 you know accrues to the work that we do. And you talk a lot in your in your reporting um, about systemic change, and I think that there's a difference again that you are working with people on the ground that are really close to the problem, and that you want to see systemic change. So I'd love you to say, not that you have one favorite campaign, you have many, but could you talk about one or two where you were at it for a number of years, and what was the systemic change on the issue? Well, I mean, one of the pieces of work that I'm most proud of in the last few years is some work we did in the city of St. Louis. Now, you know, we're a, we're a national, we're a global brand um, and company. And, you know, in the United States, we've been working on issues of systemic racism broadly, but more specifically focused in recent years on issues of public safety and police and the need to sort of rethink our approach to, to creating healthier and safer communities. We you know, because we're an ice cream company, we can't work in 60 communities uh, around the country. We just, we don't have the capacity to do that, but we do have the capacity to pick a handful of places, one or two places where we can get on the ground, support grassroots work, and then, and use that as an example to tell a larger story about the kinds of reforms that are necessary nationally. So we did that in the city of St. Louis. It was a grassroots campaign in the city of St. Louis to close a particularly horrible jail. Um, the city of St. Louis is a is about 50 percent black. This was a, a jail that was over 100 years old, uh, it, you know, unair conditioned, miserable in the summer, just a horrible place. Uh, the, the population in the prison was about 96 percent black. So it way over indexed against the population. And remarkably, almost everyone in that prison, over 95% of the people in the prison were being held pre-trial, mm. right? So they had never been convicted of the crime for which they were being held. They were being held for a lack of cash bail. And so that that fight in the city of St. Louis in many ways represents everything that's wrong with our criminal justice system. And also sort of really tests what people think of our criminal justice system. Most people believe that you're innocent until proven guilty. The idea that you could spend, and I think in the workhouse, it was something like 340 days before your case was adjudicated, that you could spend almost a year in prison without being convicted of the crime for which you're being held is fundamentally against everything we've been taught about the way in which our justice system works. And, and so, um, a, a local coalition of groups and advocates led by a woman who spent time in the workhouse prison uh, had an incredibly uh, dynamic and compelling campaign focused on getting the city of St. Louis, specific, specifically the Board of Aldermen and the mayor, to shut this prison down. And instead, to take the $14 million that was allocated to operate the, the, the prison every year and put that money into the kinds of programs and services that really support healthier and safer communities, things like job training, housing, access access to substance use disorder treatment, et cetera. It was a two and a half year campaign that ultimately led to 
the, the, the board of aldermen voting to close this prison down. City of St. Louis had built a new jail. They didn't need this capacity if they if they reduced the number of people that they were holding simply because they were poor, they didn't have access to cash bail, uh, the, 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 the jail would be redundant. They, they didn't need it. And so that's in fact what they've, what they've done in the city of St. Louis. And so we were able to bring a whole host of tools to that campaign. The activists on the ground had a strategy. We didn't, we didn't need to bring that. We brought things as simple as Ice cream. Ice cream is a wonderful convener. And so as the campaign went community by community to engage the citizens, we show up with ice cream and we draw a crowd. We have our marketing and media budgets, right? So we were able to do uh, 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 target certain constituencies in the city of St. Louis with messages on digital and social channels. We dropped our co-founders into the city of St. Louis to do a media blitz. People love to talk to Ben and Jerry. And so we got Ben and Jerry on, you know, drive time radio, morning TV to talk about the issue. And, and, and the head of the campaign joined Ben and Jerry on those media visits. Our CEO did a, a, an op-ed in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the most widely read newspaper in the city of St. Louis. So we had the ability to sort of layer on, on top of the grassroots strategy, tactics that allowed the campaign to reach additional constituencies that they likely would not have otherwise reached. Now, you know, we were a small part of, of a really important win there. And so how did you, when, when that win happened, one, how did you communicate it both internally to your team as well as externally? And then how did it make you feel? You know, the most gratifying thing I think for me was when the, when the board of aldermen finally voted to shut this thing down, the, the campaign sent out a, a, a press release and a statement on their social media channels and, you know, it was a couple paragraphs long. And at the bottom, they thanked a handful of organizations and people for being a part of this important win. And they thanked Ben and Jerry's. Seeing, you know, this global ice cream company, you know, the, the fact that these activists were willing to, you know, publicly align themselves and thank us for the work that we did was was extraordinarily gratifying. You know, we had the opportunity to to have the head of the campaign and Inez speak to employees on a couple of occasions. So folks inside the company were very familiar with the work that we were doing there and the people involved. So I think, you know, folks internally took a lot of pride and ultimately, you know, seeing this win and and. We then also communicated publicly with our our fans on our digital and social channels to celebrate the win and and really to show and highlight the power of this kind of grassroots organizing and campaigning that can win real tangible victories that make a real difference in people's lives and and really to see what happened in the city of St. Louis as a model for other communities around the country. Thank you. It's a, an amazing story. And I'd like to let our listeners know that you don't talk about consumers at Ben and Jerry's. You talk about fans and that fans have passion. And so what feedback did you get from any of your fans to this win? Our fans respond incredibly well to the, the, the kind of content that we create around these campaigns. I think it's, you know, so often in, in, in business school, I, and I know this because of the colleagues that I work with, you know, the sort of standard operating procedure around brands is this idea that you should have a sort of single value proposition, right? That you focus on one thing and you hammer that one thing across everything you do. What's great about Ben and Jerry's is we're not one thing. We're, we're like a person. We're, we're <laughs> multifaceted. Mm -hmm. We are Stephen Colbert and Jimmy Fallon. We're, you know, Colin Kaepernick and Fish and Cherry Garcia. And we're for reforming our approach to public safety and for, you know, tackling climate change in a way that ensures that the most marginalized, you know, uh, you don't pay the heaviest price. We're all of these things. And so I think that's part of what 
attracts people to the brand. You know, we're fun, we're whimsical, and we're very serious. And and so, you know, what I know is that if you look at the way in which people interact with us on our digital and social channels versus our competitors, we are something like 16, 18% of all content on social media in the ice cream category. And we're just shy of like 80% of the engagement. Oh, wow. People engage with our brand in a way that they don't with our, our competitors. And it's because we're so multifaceted and because we believe all of these things. I want our listeners to hear that because, Chris, you're, you're talking about this multidimensional and that you're not just one thing. You're not like, this is our, you know, unique selling proposition. And, and you have a personality and you, and you're courageous and you push, 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 um, knowing you can get some negative feedback. So I want to talk about Unilever a bit because, um, I got to work on Unilever. Um, I've had Paul on the, on the podcast with his great book, Net Positive. The, the day that sale was announced, by the way, and I don't think any of your listeners know this, that your sale, acquisition by Unilever was the same day as the acquisition of SlimFast. That's right. And I think I think I was the only person and I was laughing hysterically because like, I'm going to eat all my Ben and Jerry's and then I'm going to go on my SlimFast diet. But of course, it didn't keep SlimFast, which they made the, the wise decision. So can you talk a little bit about how you protected um, Ben and Jerry's and your soul when you sold to Unilever, because I think a lot of us in the purpose universe said, oh, my God, it's going to go down the, you know, the tubes. Uh, we really have Ben and Jerry and the Unilever leadership at the time to thank for creating, creating an acquisition agreement that has allowed Ben and Jerry's to retain its independence within the, the larger parent company to operate independently, to control its own destiny, to, to own, uh, the, the social mission, uh, to this incredibly unique acquisition agreement that was negotiated between the parties at the time. And, and it, it is literally, as far as I know, unique in the corporate world. I mean, typically when a, when a smaller company is acquired by a larger company, everything sort of accrues to the, to the larger purchasing company. In this case, all the financial and fiduciary responsibility for Ben and Jerry's went to Unilever. Um, however, the company was public and had a board of directors and that board of directors was retained. And, and to this day, that independent board of directors has legal authority over the company's social mission and its brand integrity. And, and that is the magic that has allowed Ben and Jerry's to pursue its independent social mission, to do the advocacy and activism work. Um, and frankly, to flourish as a business. You know, Ben and Jerry's has, has proven this model. There can be no debate that purpose somehow provides or creates friction or tension against one's ability to return to shareholders. And there's been some conversation in the press recently about, uh, you know, our companies like Unilever over indexing on purpose. We have proven that, in fact, the opposite is true. I will tell you that, you know, we have just come out of the best two back-to-back -back years in this company's history since the very early days of the company. Let there be no mistake that, that one can pursue a purpose, one can be a part of advancing sustainability, advancing social justice, while at the same time building a very strong uh, and, and profitable business. There's no conflict there. I want to talk a little bit about your um, candor. Um, as a company. And in your, um, you call it your SEER report, your social responsibility report, you really have sections in there. For example, because you're, the makeup of your employee base, especially in Burlington, Vermont, is mostly white. And so you really dr drill down into, you put teams together, you brought in experts to look at racial equity. And can you just talk a little bit about it? Because the transparency that you put into the SEER report, I think, was very refreshing. And it and it said, this is where we're weak. 
this is what we're going to, these are what we're, our goals that we're going to try and solve for. So can you talk maybe about, about the race area? Because you did it not just that area, you did other areas as well. This is something I really learned from, I, I did at my time at Seven Generation work with Jeffrey. Jeffrey was still in the company when I, when I was there. Um, you know, Jeffrey is known for this sort of commitment to radical transparency. Right. I mean, I, I would listen to Jeffrey talk and he would spend 75, 85% of his time talking about seventh generation, talking about where seventh generation was screwing it up, getting it wrong, not meeting its goals. Right. And, and, and I think people really gravitated to it. I think that level of corporate transparency that says, here's what we're trying to do. Here's where we're getting it right. And here's where it's not going so well provides a sense of sort of honesty. I think, you know, if all you do is tell people how great you are, I think, I think people smell it a mile away, right? I mean, because nobody's perfect, no company's perfect. And I think it creates some level of, of trust when you're willing to talk about not just where you're nailing it, but where you're not. So, you know, to your point on this issue of equity, Ben and Jerry's for years, you know, really our co-founders have been committed to issues of, of kind of social and racial justice. I think as we as we begun to work more on these issues as a part of our kind of day to day advocacy and social mission, to your point, our company is headquartered in the second whitest state in the country and our employee base, frankly, reflects the community in which it sits. And so, you know, we have gone about very strategically over the last few years working to change that. And it it will require a significant change in the ways of working, uh, which are underway. And so, you know, thinking strategically about how do we build a more diverse franchise base? How do we think about an employee base outside of Vermont? How do we how do we bring talent to the company, but not necessarily require them to be sitting at the corporate headquarters? And certainly, you know, we've all come to understand that, you know, Zoom and Microsoft Teams, we can operate our businesses pretty darn efficiently without us all being in the same building five days a week. Um, and we've brought people onto the leadership team at the company to spearhead the equity work. So we've we we we've, we've you know, shook up the leadership team a little bit to 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 help us more quickly uh, bring this part of our our values more squarely into the way in which the business is being operated. Which is great. And I also love the fact that you actually drill down into helping scoop shop owners and helping them with financing and perhaps education so that you can have a more equitable, fran- if you call them franchisees, um, yeah, and you're saying yes, um, so that they're part of your system. So so I think that, again, just, you know, drilling down into some of the the things that that are authentic to you, your policies, in addition to the external, I, I think that's wonderful alignment. Um, just for a, a little break on levity here, I want to ask you, what's your favorite flavor? Ah, the question, uh, you know, flavors, then I'll I, give you the well, get out of jail card. I, say, I, I do have a favorite flavor at the moment. Okay. Um, it changes, you know, okay. uh, as, as flavors come and go. It's an unsung hero in the Ben & Jerry's flavor portfolio. It's called Vanilla Caramel Fudge. And mm-hmm. Ben & Jerry's is known for super chunky flavors. Vanilla Caramel Fudge is one of the few smooth flavors. Mm. So it's just a vanilla ice cream with a caramel and fudge swirl. And it's super creamy and it's really delicious. And it's a flavor I think that, you know, is underappreciated. And and I love the fact that every year you put out a list of the top 10 flavors, which is great. And actually, there's a flavor that's kind of pays homage to me because I'm Carol Cohn, C-O-N-E, and you have the Americone Dream that you develop with Stephen Colbert. That's right. Um, and there's a great bit. Um, we'll put a link in our in our show notes. And Stephen Colbert, he has he raises, gives all the profits from this to charity, and he's given over two million dollars since he started it. So um, thank you. I didn't I didn't know that. So uh, it's another thing I'm going to play play off my name. Yes. So, so thanks so much. Um, getting back to a little more serious discussion. Um, you talk a lot about values and alignment of values of your employees, your customers. So I'd love you to talk about 
how values work with purpose. And is it the purpose leads and then the values follow or the purpose is built off of? So how does that work? The values that Ben and Jerry's holds are the, the company values, and they are very much rooted in the things that our co-founders believe and the values of our co-founders. And so our values are not a function of polling or focus grouping employees. It's not our values are not somehow connected to our product proposition, nor are they values that we believe necessarily are in common with our consumers, right? Our values are essentially the values of our, our co-founders. And, and in, in, in the book Double Dip, which Ben and Jerry wrote years ago about sort of founding the company, they tell a story about how sort of three years into running the business, they, they almost sold the company. They, they started this little ice cream shop in a dilapidated ice cream, uh, dilapidated gas station. They did it because they like to hang out together and they like to eat. And they had a great time initially and had some really good success in the first few years. But uh, sort of year three, they, they were spending a lot of time doing things they didn't love doing. They were, they were, you know, distributing ice cream around the state. They were hiring, firing, ordering ingredients. They kind of weren't doing the fun stuff. And so Ben told this sort of mentor that he had, Maurice, a restaurant tour in Southern Vermont, that he and Jerry were thinking about selling the business. And Maurice said, you can't sell this business. This is your baby. You guys are, you know, you're killing it. And, and <laughs> it's a great product. And Maurice said to Ben, if you don't like the way businesses are run and you don't like what you're, what you're doing, change the way you run your business. And that was the moment that mm, Ben sort of says Eureka. he landed on wow. what the purpose of Ben and Jerry's was. And it was to see whether one could build a successful company that could be an agent of progressive social change. So what I would say is the purpose that, that Ben defined all these years ago is the purpose of Ben and Jerry's is to be advocates for progressive social change in the world. And that the values that the company has are the values that, that we pursue in order to make change in the world. It, it, our, our values define the kinds of issues we work on uh, and the groups we work with, et cetera. And so I think the purpose is about making change. Not in one place, but but just being an agent of change, and the values are perhaps the guardrails that that help us achieve that. Thank you, because I think there's a lot of confusion um, in the marketplace, and so th that was very well stated. And just one point, if I can, Carol, I, I think what's important. I think what people can agree or disagree with a position that we hold. You know, we believe strongly in, uh, you know, a woman's right to choose and to access reproductive health, right? We, we believe that the current system of policing and public safety disproportionately impact and harm communities of color. And we believe that, you know, we ought to spend less on cops and, and more on other programs and services, right? And it's okay if people don't agree with us on those issues. But we believe in those things because they're rooted in these values that are so important to the company. And so while people may agree or disagree on those issues, it's hard for them to challenge the reason why we do it. And that's because we have these firmly held beliefs. They're our beliefs. They're not someone else's beliefs. They're not our consumers' beliefs. And I think that is a critical part, again, of the authenticity that we have on these things. You, it, it's, it's hard to claim that we're just doing this stuff to sell more ice cream because we, we have a set of values that, that the work is rooted in and we have a long history of kind of centering those values uh, at the heart of the, 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 the company. So if you're a company that doesn't have a Ben and Jerry, the big founder story, um, and by the way, I have to tell our listeners that if you listen to the Ben and Jerry's and, and lots of great podcasts, the fact that we would have been talking about bagels 
if they had had enough money <laughs> to buy some bagel, right. bagel baking equipment, but cheaper, they, it, cheaper it, was to cheap, make ice cream. it was cheaper to make ice cream. And they, they spent like $5 on a correspondence course with the SBA. So it's, it's just a very funny, jovial, great story that, that just became um, an amazing uh, movement of, of authenticity. If you don't have a Ben and Jerry, as a founder, or they've left so f- long ago, like an HP, um, you know, in the garage and stuff. How do you find the values then? Because you said don't listen to the employees, but is it then at that point you have to listen to the employees? No, I, I think, and and uh, I, I won't, I won't name the company that that I I did a little bit of work with, but a very large global company that was sort of searching for its purpose. Uh, I was part of a small team that did some work with them. And there is a story to every company and every brand, right? It's there. These companies and brands are started by people who believe something. I mean, you know, even going back to Unilever's founding in Port Sunlight in the UK, where where the the right the the founder created this community and he invested in the lives and livelihoods of the employees because he felt so strongly about the health and safety of the people working at the company. So I think there is a story to every company that's rooted in something some belief or some core value. And I think the job to be done is to unearth that and, and to bring that to light. And, and that can help define you. It's important that, you know, that purpose or the values of a company are rooted in something real, not contrived or made up or appropriated from your consumer base because you think that's going to, you know, be a selling strategy. I think that's the most important thing. Root it in something real. And I think it's there. I mean, I love that that Mars, I mean, the, the Mars family kind of had principles, but they finally decided they were going to sit there and determine their purpose. And they came up with something that was so profound, which is, you know, the world we want tomorrow is how we do business today. Boy, that that states it. And, you know, when COVID hit, you know, were they going to let people go or not? So um, I love your point about it's there. You have to unearth it. And it and sometimes it's it's just a lot of work, but, but it's worthwhile. It's great work. I am. Oh, it's great. It's wonderful work. And then you see, you know, unleashing the purpose within the company and, and it's extraordinary. Can you talk a little bit about some of your new campaigns? Um, you know, if change is brewing, um, you, you, you made a huge declaration, you know, after George Floyd. And I and you say the lynching of George Floyd, which I think is really interesting language. You're very precise in your language at Ben and Jerry's. But we must dismantle white supremacy. So you've got some really in your face campaigns. And so can you illuminate for the larger companies that might not go quite to that level, but, you know, again, what you could share that you learned from there that they could learn in their own activism, excuse me, activism campaigns? If you take that statement that we released in in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, it, it was the most widely read and shared piece of corporate communications in the company's history, right? And it was held up as sort of not just a statement that resonated from a company, but just something that resonated with people broadly. And, and you know, I think the key to it was that, to your point, we used very clear language we we you know sort of spoke a bit of truth to power we we both you know talked about what had happened but also the kinds of policies that were needed to kind of address this and and prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future when when you contrast what we did with a number of other companies and organizations, you know, I, I don't want to be too <laughs> harsh, but, you know, I mean, the NFL was roundly criticized for putting a statement out that didn't even mention the word 
racism in the context of what had happened to George Floyd. And I think where where companies get it wrong and where companies find themselves in a bit of trouble is when they try and negotiate a sort of messy, non-controversial, mushy middle, right? Mushy middle. I love, I wanted to bring up mushy middle. Yeah. We want to say something, but we don't want to say anything that sort of upsets people. So we're going to try and thread a needle here. And that's, that's typically where it goes wrong. I mean, it is true that we have a number of people who disagree with our point of view and we hear from them. They call us, they email us, they comment on our social media channels. And I think if, if there weren't people that disagreed with something we said, I think we probably wouldn't be saying something that was very important. And so, you know, I think part of, part of doing this is, is having the courage to, to say things that you believe to be true about the world and to do it in a way, in a way that's unafraid of those who will disagree with you. And I think we are fortunate to have a leadership team at Ben and Jerry's to have a culture that is, is, is willing to deal with the, the pushback that comes from having strong beliefs about the world whether it's this statement in response to uh, the murder of George Floyd, or as you talked about, uh, our current work around public safety and policing, we launched a flavor called Change is Brewing. Uh, and, and we really have used the flavor as a platform to talk about a landmark piece of legislation called the People's Response Act that would essentially create uh, a public health lens on the issue of public safety, really understanding that public safety really is a function of public health and that we need to make investments in public health in order to create safer communities. And so, um, you know, just, but, but, you know, there are many who have come at us and said, well, you're just anti-police. And I think, you know, that is obviously not the case. This is about public safety, not about police. But I think, you know, understanding that that is the price of, of being advocates for change in the world is that there are going to be folks that are going to disagree with you and they're going to let you know. Yeah. Um, you call them purpose pints, which I think is great. How do you decide on which issues you will create a flavor? It's as much art as science. There's, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, you know, we we typically we have a handful of limited batch flavors every year, typically four. And we typically decide to use one to to sort of highlight and promote the campaign work that we're working on at that time. And so we've been, we've been working uh, uh, on issues of public safety. Um, we, we partnered up with Congresswoman Cori Bush from the city of St. Louis who introduced the people's response act. She helped launch the flavor with us. And, you know, and it, it again, we talked earlier about having this unique set of tools in our sort of, activism toolbox and these limited batch flavors are one of them i mean what's what's really fun about launching an ice cream flavor is you know remarkably people love ice cream and it gets a ton of coverage whenever we <laughs> announce a new flavor and and we play a little bit of of kind of bait and switch when we launch these these campaign or purpose pints right which is we get the issue that the that the flavor is dedicated to in this case Public Safety and the People's Response Act, it becomes a part of the story of the flavor launch. And that's covered in places that don't traditionally <laughs> talk about those kinds of issues, right? Delish and Eater and all of these places, food blogs and, and influencers that will lift up this story in, in, in expose new audiences to these ideas. And so again, it, 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 it it adds a new audience and and uh, new channels for this issue that if a congressperson was just sending out a press release introducing a piece of legislation, yeah, I wouldn't, get it. wouldn't right. reach. Right. Absolutely. So th this has been a great conversation. And, and unfortunately, we're getting down to the bottom of it. But I would love you, Chris, to, you know, Ben and Jerry's is so unique. 
and, you know, like Patagonia. I mean, really living and breathing, you know, what you believe um, and having fans, not consumers. So for the younger, I'm going to say a younger professional in a company um, who really wants to do the kind of things you're doing, but they may not quite have the foundational beliefs to truly push the envelope. What do you suggest to them? What are the two or three or four things that you could suggest? Because activism is being desired and pushed, especially by Gen Z. But how do they do it correctly when they're not Ben and Jerry's? People often look at Ben and Jerry's and say, well, they can do it because they're Ben and Jerry's, right. but I, we can't do that, right? And and the only reason we can do it at Ben and Jerry's is because we do it, right? <laughs> I mean, I, the, it, it, there's no magic to, you know, South Burlington, Vermont, and, you know, that, that gives us the ability to do this. So I think... I think any company can do it. I mean, to your point, Patagonia, I mean, they, they sell coats. There's nothing magic about coats that makes it right. And so I think you noted something important. The, the world is changing. Citizens are expecting something different of corporations than was the case in the past. So I think the landscape around corporate citizenship and, and purpose, if you will, is shifting. Companies have made commitments inside their companies to do things like reduce their environmental impact, to increase their social impact, uh, 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 making commitments on things like gender equity and racial equity. Companies are increasingly being asked to weigh in on issues outside the company that are connected to those commitments that they've made internally. So if you're Delta Airlines, or if you're Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia, and you have committed to things like racial equity at the executive level and across the company, what is your point of view on the rollback of voting rights in Georgia, right? Those companies were pulled into that, into that fight, sort of unwillingly at at first, but they ultimately had to define their position on it. We're going to see more of that. And I think we'll see more of that as both citizens from outside companies demand it, but also as employees inside demand more of it. And so I think, going back to your question, I think there is a role and an opportunity for employees inside companies to be advocates for their firms and companies to be a part of helping society solve some of these problems that we're wrestling with. This is an incredibly important time, I think, in our nation's history, when the very fundamental form of government of ours is being challenged. And for better, or for worse, businesses and corporations are incredibly powerful entities within society. They have an interest in stability, as we all do, and in the institutions that, that govern our society. And so I think corporations and brands and companies need to be more outspoken about these things. And I think one of the ways that we will get there is, is by employees being advocates internally for corporations stepping up and taking some form of responsibility for ensuring you know, that they are a part of helping society solve problems, not tear society apart. And then using their personal social media, they can have tremendous megaphones and reach huge platform, right? And, and you know, at a time when, you know, people's opinion of policymakers and elected officials is in the toilet, people have a strong affinity and relationship with the companies and brands that they care about. And so that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for those companies and brands to do more than just talk to people about a product or service transaction, right? And, and, you know, it goes back to the insight Ben had so many years ago, right? Which was the, the, the strongest bonds that you can create with your consumers, your fans, is around a shared set of values. It's not just around pulling a pint of ice cream out of a freezer case, right? It, it's about building relationships with people around a shared set of values. And that's what this kind of work does when you do it right. It both creates impact in the world and it creates a bond between your company and and your consumers and fans. I think on that, Chris, 
th- that's just such great wisdom. And um, we could go for hours. So maybe I'll invite you back in about a year because I'd love to have you back and, and just talk about some additional campaigns. I want all of our listeners to be more courageous, as Chris said. And, you know, you don't have to have every single, dare I say, consumers. If you evolve to fans, they will be more loyal. They will probably eat or use more of your wonderful products. And they're going to tell your stories. You know, in this world of communications, everybody goes, you know, ads don't do it anymore. It's about the real story. So I'm going to give you the last word because I always like to give the last word in closing to our guest. I think you nailed it, Carol. Be courageous. Have have the courage to take this work on. Build it and, and they will come. It's been great to chat with you, Carol. Oh, no, it's, it's just wonderful. And um, I just want to thank Chris Miller for joining us today with a storied brand. Um, I've learned so much even more than and I will still now I've added all this incredible um, patina around my vision of talking with Ben and Jerry's in the early days and keep up the great work. And you are an incredible role model for so many in companies. Um, I think you're, we're going to see a lot more people in roles of activism. And I, I also love the point that you said, reach out and work with people on the ground, civil society, NGOs. They are closest enough to the issue. And then, you know, be brave. So thank you, Chris Miller. And we're going to put some wonderful connections in the show notes. And of course, since my name is Carol Cohn, it's just been a special (laughs) little segment for me. So thank you very much. And we're going to keep an eye on all the great work that Ben and Jerry's is doing. So thank you. Thanks, Carol. So to our listeners, um, please, please, please go to the places that you listen to your podcasts. And I trust you're going to love them as we're getting great feedback and give us lots of five stars because we want to rise up in the pantheon of business podcasts because purpose is no longer just for a small sliver in an organization today. It's for every employee, every person in leadership, every up and coming student um, and practitioner and NGO and community engagement member. Um, We have to work together to dare I say, and here's my political view save our democracy and whether it's you know one brief um you know volunteerism moment or really speaking out but please 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 take part engage because only in that way will we have a better world so welcome and thank you um from all of our fans from purpose 360 and thank you chris miller again 